Thanks, Izzy. Um, so, hello, everybody. I'm Charlotte. Um, I'm guessing somebody's going to start yelling at me if you can't hear me. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that you can all hear me. Um, so today I'm going to be a little bit egotistical and basically talk about myself um, and my, my journey with R, um, as it kind of said in my bio. And so I've just had my one year anniversary, um, literally just a few days over, um, where I became a lecturer at the University of Auckland. And as Elizabeth mentioned in the chat, I, I joined Auckland um, from Neewa down in Hamilton. So Elizabeth used to be my, uh, my old uh, Hamilton mate. Um, and so if you want to follow along with the slides, there's the link. Um, I don't know whether you'll get too much more out of it, but it might, there might be, some, um, might be some links that you might want to follow later on. Um, and I'm going to be talking about basically how I came across R um, and what I do day to day with R at the moment. Um, apart from swearing with it, I promise this is censored. Um, so hopefully you won't hear me swear too much. So I started my, my statistical journey or my career, I guess, at Prifysgol Aberystwyth, which is Aberystwyth University in Mid Wales. I'm Welsh. Um, and so there I did my degree, my undergraduate degree in mathematics. And we were told, I think that at the time, our official um, sort of note from the university was, check your email once a week, maybe, um, because the lecturer might have emailed you. And that would have been, you know, the lecturer would have been very excited about emailing us and will have told us about four times pre previous to that in the lecture. So we did not use computers at all. We had blackboards, um, occasionally whiteboards, which was very, very exciting when we had whiteboards. And not until my sort of final year did, did one of our lecturers discover the, the power of PowerPoint. And I'm, I'm not kidding about that. So as the sort of meme says on the left there, I had absolutely no idea what R was. My first introduction to R was when I was looking at going to do masters um, or PhDs and I started emailing around uh, different universities and different professors saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in doing a PhD. What kind of projects have you got? Or I'm interested in doing a masters. And one professor emailed me back and said, oh, um, do you know R? And that was that was literally the email. And I was, I was sort of a, a, a very young undergrad going, well, I'm assuming they don't mean the letter R in the alphabet. And so I went to our dusty old library and there was a, an ancient book or what looked like a very dusty book um, about, you know, R and how it was the, uh, the language and how it went from S. And, and I really had no idea at all what R was um, because all I did at the time was was basically scratch out and solve differential equations um, but don't ask me to do that now because i forgot i forgot how to solve all the differential equations when i came across that um, so i moved on from aberystwyth university to the university of st andrews and that's where i covered my phd or my masters and my phd and that's where i came across r I came across R concurrently with SAS, which is very confusing because all I remember about SAS is basically the word PROC. And so it's kind of a really steep learning curve for me. Um, during my master's was having to learn both of these sort of languages and not really know what I was doing. And so I can really sympathize with the students that I now teach um, when, they're, when they're very excited that something has been printed out to the console. I, I remember that feeling very much. and being like, well, I've got something. It must have worked, this magical black box. And so that's kind of where I was after my master's. Um, and moving on to a PhD, I kind of felt almost like a lot of peer pressure. I guess peer pressure is maybe the wrong word, um, makes it sound, sound a bit scary. But I had a lot of peer pressure from, from everybody around me um, who was much better versed in these kind of things. And I'm quite a competitive person. Um, and I guess something clicked in the sense that that's when I really started to dig into it. And that's when I really started to to use R um, and become much more sort of computer versed or computer literate, I guess. Um, and during my time there, uh, that's when I was introduced to things like Git, you know, version control, um, when I came across Linux and Emacs. Um, and these are, this is still my workflow to this day, basically. Um, Git, Linux and Emacs is, is basically all I do. Eero will hate me because on her door she has a, a Vim poster or a Vim sticker. Um, <laughs> but this is my, um, yeah, this is kind of what I do today. And it all started at the University of St. Andrews when I came across a, 
and you know, went to a software carpentry workshop. And that was kind of the beginnings um, of just hearing about these things and then going ahead and going away and myself learning them. And from the University of St Andrews, I moved to New Zealand and that's where I uh, got a job at NIWA, I think in 2017. And that's kind of where I transitioned from, um, or I'd like to think, I sort of transitioned from being a student of R to actually having to, to not teach R, but to show others like the benefits of R and the benefits of things like version control and things like that. Um, and because I felt like those of you um, who are aware of kind of what goes on at NIWA, there's a lot of, of repetition of, of kind of stuff that really could benefit from being streamlined with all these tools. And people are certainly aware of these tools and there are some great people that work there. Um, but there's also this kind of, I felt there was a bit of a divide between the people who, who use these tools and know how beneficial they are um, and people who, who don't move ahead or don't move with the move with the flow, so to speak. So I kind of felt myself transitioning at NIWA to try and like push push my agenda on everybody else and my agenda of R, um, which uh, you know for the better or not. <laughs> um, and so at NIWA, I I did uh, a little bit sort of came full circle, if you like, um, and became a software carpentry instructor. This is kind of my you know dipping my toe. In there for the first time. Um, I'm not quite sure if you're aware of the software carpentry stuff, um, but to become an instructor, basically they were doing Zoom before Zoom was cool, um, and during during your time, um, you're basically asked to go into breakout rooms. And I, this is my one claim to fame, <laughs> and I've probably told a few of you this story before, but my one claim to fame was that on or during a software carpentry call we were sent in, into breakout rooms and I was sent out into breakout rooms with somebody called Charlotte who used to live in New Zealand and we were asked to discuss um, you know what we kind of use day to day what would be something that we might want to teach people um, it was all really informal and so at the time I was dealing with a lot of CSV files um, working in a Crown Research Institute you get sent loads of files um, of a base the same structure that you basically want to read into R really quickly um, and just create one big data frame so these three lines of code on your left basically do that. And that's how I you know, I'd use these three lines of code daily. Basically the first one I'm reading all in the, the .csv file names for my working directory. I'm then reading them all into a list. And I love the function do call. Um, and then just are binding them into a data frame. So this I kind of explained on my, on my software carpentry call um, to the, the lady called Charlotte. And she probably, she said, well, to be honest, I'd probably do it in a line and I'd use tidyverse. And that's when I came out with, well, I don't really like tidyverse. Um, it's not something that I, I use too much of. Then I realized her second name was Wickham. And I had just told Hadley Wickham's sister that I didn't really like tidyverse. Uh, we haven't spoken since, so I don't know whether that's related or not. <laughs> so from Niwa, I moved on to the University of Auckland and that's uh, July last year and I'd say now um, this is kind of what I spend my day to day doing uh, basically either teaching R or researching using R. So this meme was going around uh, doing the rounds I think a few months ago and basically I think a lot of us can really relate to this. <laughs> um, my code runs um, that's that's kind of where you start, right? That's where you start with your code. It runs and you're happy. Um, and then you spend time perfecting it, um, hopefully. But it's a good thing to teach students, or I find it's a really good thing to teach students is that just because I can do our code, it's still messy. And I still you know, look up to, to many, many people who, who do or write a lot cleaner or neater our code than I do. So what's some, or I guess 40% of my work is teaching. Um, and so just as well as teaching R, or just as well as teaching students how to use R, I like using R to make pretty GIFs. And a few of you would have seen this GIF, um, or in this and some other GIFs in the Saturday's Days conference. Um, basically, it's, it's just looping through different animations or through different uh, plots in R using R code. And I really like this idea of using 
the plot that students themselves produce so they can kind of see that link um, between the GIF that you've made and what they're actually trying to learn. And so this is a GIF trying to illustrate PCA or kind of what PCA is doing with those rotating axes there. Um, and if you're interested, you can go onto my GitHub and steal the GIFs or write your own, you know, steal the code to modify it probably and to be something quite better. So that's probably um, one of the main ways that I use R um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to illustrate things is by basically spending and wasting my time doing pretty pictures. Um, and so this last term, I was teaching a load of BioSci students, um, obviously not on campus. This was, all, this was all done online and all done remotely, um, but I had written my notes beforehand. Um, and so this is kind of one of the things that I like to show students before really delving into the, the maths, I guess, because a lot of biology students or a lot of bioSci students aren't necessarily that well versed in mathematics. Um, and so I find it really useful just to show them a pretty moving picture. And to be honest, even if, if people are well versed in maths, um, actually showing a pretty uh, moving picture works quite well. I mean, who does F tests by hand anyway nowadays? Um, that's what I had to do in my undergrad. <laughs> um, but nobody, nobody calculates that by hand. We've all got R to do that. And so I spent a lot of my time or wasted a lot of my time um, making, making this plot here. And one element of this plot, so this is kind of where I'm going to ask you to, to put something in the chat here. One element of this plot took me a whole day to make. <laughs> and I want you to try and guess which one specific <laughs> element of this plot had Charlotte swearing a lot. So I'm going to give you a few minutes maybe to, to have a look in the chat and, and try and guess what element of this plot took me a wee while. Ooh, legends. Legends is a good one. No, the legends, legends were pretty simple. And I'm sure somebody better versed than in ggplot would be uh, <laughs> would be a lot quicker. The error bars, again, they they weren't too bad. Um, but yeah, so maybe somebody versed in, in ggplot better than I can. Labeling the axes was was relatively easy. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. It's the it's it's the F statistic curve. Something to do with that. <laughs> Nobody else is willing to take a guess from what I can see. So actually it was shading the area. Yay! <laughs> yeah, it was exactly the same time. So Belinda Belinda Mayer got, got the answer right there. It was shading the area under the curve. And somebody else might, might know how to do this in one line, um, but that took me a day to do and a lot of swearing. And at that point, I did wonder why I was wasting my time trying to basically just color, color something in in gray. But I'm convinced that even that, that day well spent, I'll use this GIF or a variation of these GIFs um, from years to come. So that's kind of one element of using, um, of using R that I do, or how I use R in my teaching. Ooh, just gonna move there. Um, and the second way is, is an idea I stole directly from Anna Ferguson from the University of Auckland um, and is, is basically based on using memes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a cool kid, right? We can all pretend to be cool kids by using, by using memes nowadays. Um, but I kind of like the, the playful idea of bringing code and memes in together um, and using quite a PASAG um, <laughs> approach on the left there by telling a student off about their code and introducing the idea of a, a minimal working example. Um, so that's another way I kind of bring R into, into the way I teach. Ooh, just need to reload that. Um, and something, a sort of an a R shiny tool that, uh, that I wrote or that I developed is uh, you know, relatively simple, looks like your sort of generic R shiny type tool. Um, it doesn't look particularly pretty, um, but it's a good way of getting students to play around with different things, um, getting them to play around with the idea of these parameters of the distribution um, and lets them see and lets them interactively change how things work. So this is a, a, another sort of extension to R, if you like, this, the idea of, of posting something on, on R Shining. Um, the next thing that I steal off um, 
something that I steal off Twitter is art. So Alison Horst um, is, works for our studio and I really like stealing her art because she has some really cool, really cool um, sort of deputations or illustrations of um, different statistical techniques and things like that, um, as well as different R packages. So if you haven't heard of her, I would recommend going and having a look. Um, and she's perfectly happy for, for people to use her art as long as, as, long as she's um, obviously correctly um, identified. And the other thing that I, or the other way I use R to teach is by live coding. And <laughs> live coding is a dangerous thing and has this sort of stigmatism associated with it. Um, but it's something that I'm actually really quite happy to do. And I really like doing in front of my students. And I've heard that my students like it too. They tell me they like it. And they mainly like it because I make every single mistake under the sun and not on purpose. I do it anyway. It's sort of natural for me to make these mistakes, but I'm perfectly happy digging myself out of holes. Um, so as you'll see now, these are um, sort of four common mistakes that we make every day um, and that we know how to deal with. But actually as a student, they get really, or I found that they get really confused and really lost um, as soon as that sort of red error comes up in their, in their R console. And however many times I tell them that most of the error messages are written in plain English, um, it can be really difficult for students to kind of, to kind of realize that the computer isn't trying to take over their lives, um, but it is actually trying to tell them what they've done wrong. And so I naturally, I don't have to set this up. I naturally make these mistakes, um, you know, reading in the wrong data file or not having that data file in my working directory, misspelling things all the time um, and forgetting to create objects. So actually that's kind of another way that I, I use R and I claim that it's the best way to use, um, you know, best way to teach coding is by making these mistakes. And the other 40 or sort of the, the next sort of big chunk of my of my job um, is research. And this is something that I, again, heavily use R in. So you can see a pretty plot here. This was done in base R. Um, and so a lot of my research is based on point processes uh, or point patterns. And by that, I mean the locations of objects or events in space. So you can think about these two dots here as two objects, if you like. Um, and what I'm interested in is the kind of the structure of a point pattern. So think of many, many points. Um, they can, you know, they've got some structure to that pattern, like the locations of trees, for example, in a forest. There's some structure to the pattern of where those trees are. So I'm interested in, or mainly interested in, what drives that structure? What's, you know, what's, what's um, driving the locations of the trees, so to speak? And so I use R to try and figure this out or to try and better understand this um, in a modeling kind of framework and using some maths there too. And here I've even got some Sokato from, uh, from high school math. Um, and this actually the application here um, wasn't trees, wasn't ecology, but was actually in cancer uh, research. So basically what we had were the locations of all nuclei locations on a slide of different tissue sections of tumors. Um, and in really simple speak, this is the way I understand it, there are good cells and there are bad cells um, in a tumor. Um, they are called stroma and the, and the tumor cells. And basically it's by looking at the structure of those two types of cells um, and looking at the pattern formed by their nuclei, we could try and see whether um, worse patients or what the sort of prognosis of patients were um, based on their structure and whether we could tease apart a tumor that was really quite aggressive from a tumor that wasn't quite so aggressive. And so that's some work um, that I did a few years ago. And the other part of, on the other sort of part of my work that I'm working on now is to do again with point patterns and this idea of um, self-excitation or, or what I'd say was clustering of points. And so we can think about these three plots down here as just a simple intensity surface. And so where we've got these darker areas of blue, we have more points, you know, so more trees maybe grow in wetter areas or different types of trees grow in wetter areas. And that changes slowly over time. So we can see that the structure of this blob here kind of changes gradually as we go from the top to the bottom. But that's not necessarily the only thing driving it. Um, and so here we've got a point. We have a point that's, that's come up in this blob of blue. And we've got the same structure of the, the process underneath, if you like, the, the wetness of the field and the example I've just given. 
And as well as that kind of underlying intensity, we can think of a jump. So this self-excitation, the idea of self-excitation means as soon as we observe a point or as soon as an event happens, we get a slight jump in the intensity. So that's what this little hat is here. And that causes, directly causes an event next door. And we see another hat over here. And because of this bump, we get um, a direct cause, again, another, uh, another point popping up here. So we end up with clusters of points because as soon as something else occurs, we get, um, we get another event close by. And this is really quite pertinent in something like earthquake research um, or terrorism activity, if you like. Um, we're interested in the direct cause of one event due to a nearby event in space and time rather than just this sort of underlying predisposition of gradual change that you might see in the forestry example I gave. So that's a pretty plot. Um, and then here's some, or well, it's actually C++ code that's called through R. So that's kind of how I use R in, me, in my research. And another pretty plot, um, and it's something that I'm going to be, be tying up with now, is really something that I've been looking at recently. And that's um, by visualizing rivers or actually by looking at network data. And so um, if you go, I think, yeah, but if you wanna make this pretty plot, there's the GIS there. And so if you go to my slides, you can, you can steal, the, steal the pretty plot from my GIS or make your own pretty plot. And here, um, I'm just gonna be talking about how we visualize rivers or how we actually get um, the data from the rivers is actually freely available um, from the Ministry of the Environment. So um, still under development um, is the package that is on my GitHub. It's not, it's not ready to be used by anybody yet <laughs> because it will break. Um, but I'll give you an example that doesn't quite break anything. Um, so let's just load these packages. Um, and I'm just gonna be talking about some example data um, and those of you who are used to um, spatial data, basically, I'm just going to be showing you a river network. Okay, so here I'm just using my example data, which happens to be the Waikato River Network. Here I'm using the simple features, the SF package, um, to make it into a, a sort of a simpler <laughs> spatial feature. And here I'm just showing you how it's plotted in ggplot. Um, so all I've got is basically a spatial lines data frame um, and it's the, showing me the network of the Waikato River here. Ooh, okay. So some of the functions of Hexar kind of allow us to, to visualize this network in a, in a slightly different way um, or to get or extract other information out of it. So here we're just showing you the, oh, I'm just showing you the different regions of the different reaches of the Waikato River. Um, we've got some in the actually happen in the Bay of Plenty. Um, randomly, I'm not quite sure whether this is right. This is um, in Manamatu. Um, and then up here, we've got a couple that are actually in Auckland. So this is the Waikato. Obviously, mainly the Waikato River is in the Waikato district, uh, funnily enough. Okay. So one thing that I stole, um, and this is kind of what I'm, I'm doing with this, or what I'm trying to do with this package, is, is use the idea of hex bins. So this is an idea I stole from Thomas Lumley, um, who, who has his hex bin districts um, that he actually presented at the, the Satar days. Um, and I'm kind of using a similar idea here to be able to um, visualize different um, aspects of each of these different segments um, of the river. So this isn't a particularly good illustration because my screen, screen's quite small, but each of these areas is like a different, different hex bin. Um, and this is kind of what the Hexar packages, package allows you to do. So once you've got that data, the example data that I showed you, it's plotting um, using a, a particular number of hex bins, if you like, is pot plotting the river network for you. Um, and you can extract different features of each segment. Um, and here I'm just showing you the distance to see, nothing particularly interesting, but this is contained in the example data. Um, and you can um, color different segments of these hexes in um, up to about six, depending on what you, what you want to see. So it's a good way of visualizing different sort of proportions or relative as to how things change downstream or what you might be interested in. Um, and you can see that the sort of ki same kind of setup for ggplot um, has been maintained. So you've got these things of fill and color um, that changes what you'd expect it to um, based on sort of essentially writing your own geom 
or writing the own geom that allows you to do this. Everything else works like, um, you know, facets and things like that as well. And so the final bit of this um, that I want to, to draw attention to is basically downloading the, the rich data that's from MFE. And this is where I started to play around with APIs. Um, and so the MFE online have this great database of stuff um, that's sort of people from NIWA and people from all over the place actually sort of put the data that they've really carefully collected um, over many, many years. And it's kind of, it's quality controlled as well. And so it's a really good resource for, for sort of looking at data or for getting data um, for different areas. So if we run this hexar function, we can actually see what data is available. Um, and so this just gets us a data frame with 235 observations with three variables and shows us the sort of the title um, of what that data frame is, as well as an abstract um, telling us what that data set contains and the layer ID. So along with your API key, which you will have to register through the um, internet or which you'll have to register through the MFE site, it gives you a layer ID. And the idea is for this R package, will automatically download it, given a key um, and given a layer ID. Um, it will automatically download that data into R for you. And then you can, um, here is just a spatial points data frame and you can do what you will with that. Um, and so there's a really quite a rich range of data that's there um, that's accessible, um, but bringing it into R is a, little bit, is a little bit difficult because you know it's the point and click thing. So this is why I love working with APIs. It makes it a lot easier um, and a lot nicer. And the idea is to sort of have different ways of visualizing this um, and different ways of playing around with this data without being it too sort of click and or point and click heavy. So that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. Um, and that's an overview really of, of how I use R in my teaching and my research. Um, I do a little bit of fun as well. Um, and I guess it counts as data viz. I don't really know. Um, it's New Zealand and I decided one day to use an emoji package to plot the big things in New Zealand. I haven't seen all of these things. I have seen the limit of the LMP bottle, obviously the sky tower. Um, what else have I seen? I think I've seen the big carrot um, and I haven't been down south much. So I haven't seen any of these guys down here. So I'm sure this counts as data viz. Um, of course there are not, um, you can, uh, you know, I'm sure you can see that there's a really important side to always working with R is working with emojis too. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank my unwitting helpers, Eero, who gave us the Our Ladies talk last, uh, last month. And that's basically how I decided that I can no longer go back to using Beamer, that I have to use Sharingan. So thank you to her for making me do all of this extra work and learning something new. Anna Ferguson for everything, basically teaching wise that I steal from her. Um, she might not know this, but she does now. And essentially, if you put something on Twitter or GitHub, I will steal it. Um, but you can, of course, steal from me too. So there are some, there are some links there. Um, if you're interested, please have a look. Um, but thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'll try and answer any questions um, that come up in the chat. The reason for the dragon is that I'm Welsh, as I mentioned to begin with. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, can you explain, oh, whoops, I missed this one. MFE is the Ministry for the Environment. Um, so basically it's a, a New Zealand um, New Zealand based um, entity um, that does a lot of collating of all the sort of environmental data. I assumed everybody would be from New Zealand. I apologize. I should move that. Maybe I'll stop sharing and seeing if there are any other questions. Ooh, what helped me the most when I was first learning R? Um, that's a really good question. And I guess perseverance um, is a really non, um, non answer, I guess. Um, I think I think it's really quite difficult to sort of remember back to those days when you when you were trying to use R. And one thing that I really remember was not knowing what on earth I was doing. 
Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's important to remember that when you're trying to teach other people, um, or I find that important. When I'm trying to teach students at the moment is to remember that I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, you know, that whole idea of that black box thing, because I had no idea about computer or computer languages. So I couldn't even sort of get my head around that. And it was really when I started you know, things started working that it kind of started clicking for me. And I think it was having a lot of people around who were helpful um, and, and who were, I don't know, understanding, I guess. Um, I think competition helped too, because I'm quite competitive. So, so I wanted to be as good as everybody else. <laughs> Have I used SF much? Um, no. Um, but it's a little bit quicker dealing with you know, converting them to SF is a little bit quicker than the old school way. So I've heard um, of like spatial lines, beta frames and things like that. So I haven't done too much work with SF, but I think it's a, a nice segue. And I think it plays a little bit better with um, geom um, or the sort of geom aspects of it. How long does it take to download data from um, a CVR? Uh, not too long, depending on obviously how big the file is. So quite a lot of the data will just be spatial points data frame that we saw there. And it's just different sites throughout New Zealand. Um, if we're thinking of like a really big spatial river lines network, then it'll take a, a wee while. Um, but I think the most it's taken me has been about um, a minute or so, roughly, depending on connections and all of that kind of stuff but it is only New Zealand based, so. Or maybe that means the data is not as rich as I, as I claimed it was. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, uh, I just read the later question. I'll, want, I'll answer the one before that first. Um, was there much take up um, towards using R during your time at NIWA? I think, I mean, probably Elizabeth, um, who's, who's also on this call, is, is a better person to an, um, answer that. I felt that there was a, a lot of the younger generation, I guess is a nice way to put it, were already like well versed in using R. Um, and I think there were quite a few people who realized that they needed to, to use it, but it was one of those situations where time was kind of precious. Um, and the, the way NIWA works is that, you know, you have to find, you have to build for hours and things like that. Um, and so people would, would get frustrated by not doing as well or not learning R as quickly because they'd come back to it once every two weeks. And that's not the way that you learn something new really. Um, you know, you've forgotten what you've learned last time. It's something that you have to do, spend a lot of time on. And the office that I was at was in Hamilton, I would say had the least proportion of people who were, who were sort of R savvy, as it were. Um, I think, you know, certainly when you've got, you know, Wellington and Auckland that have a lot of people who work with the, the Nessie and that kind of thing, there was a lot more sort of uptake for, for or a lot more people around that could do it. Um, whereas I felt the office that I was in um, were kind of a little bit, maybe a little bit um, reticent because it was a lot more applied work that was going on there. Um, but there were some really cool people um, there. What sort of, oh, is ggplot the package which leads you the most swearing for you? Um, actually, my own, my own code leads to the most swearing for me because I got nobody else to blame. Um, I, don't, I don't actually use ggplot <laughs> that much. Um, most of my fancy plots, I, I stick to base R. Um, but it does, it does make me swear when I'm trying to change something really small like legends um, and things that are, are so obvious to me in base are that ggplot for some reason doesn't let you do. But I always put that down to myself, um, not really knowing what I'm doing. Uh, Elizabeth, what sort of applications are you using the clustering techniques for? What kinds of data? Um, at the moment, I'm working with somebody who does a lot of work with terrorism activity. Um, I've done a little bit of work with ecological data. But actually I find, you know, in statistics, I kind of solve problems that maybe nobody's got and then, and then go and look for those problems to see, if, you know, to say that I've solved them, um, <laughs> which maybe is not the best way to do it. 
Does NIWA provide open data? Um, so it will be done through the, the data that they do provide will all be done online. There are different banks online. Um, and I think it's through things like coordinates um, with a K. Um, and there are other portals online that you can access the data they provided. Um, and so, you know, it's not just it's not just NIWA. There's a lot of other a lot of other sort of data providers out there, and they're all done through online portals, um, and they're all accessible through APIs. And it's it's all pretty cool. Um, it's not necessarily clean, even though it says it is, um, but we're all used to that. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth can attest can attest to, to the description of NIWA better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> is there any particular reason? I think it's because I didn't learn it when I was when I was first starting, um, and I'm probably one of those people that I guess it, it. I just find it not as natural, and I think that's because I haven't played around with it much. I really like it for teaching, um, and I really think it's easier for students. Well, I do that. It's easier for students to pick up. Um, because it kind of looks a, a bit more a bit more like you're writing right that's the whole reason behind it um, that that I like it I like it for doing that but naturally I just find myself doing what I learned first off and maybe that's because I was so proud of myself for learning it um, first of all one thing that I say it's a lot easier for doing or that I found it was a lot easier for doing when I was back at Niwa um, was you know, all these mutate and those plies and those those sort of left join, right join things um, when you're wanting to basically merge data frames. Um, sometimes if you try and do that with, with merge or things like that, everything goes wrong and you have no idea what you've done. Um, so I do like it for that kind of stuff, um, but not, mu not, not much of a reason really. 